Aaron, stop thinking about making a calculus you video. You don't want to make a calculus video. Aaron, you don't, don't want to add make a yet calculus another video. calculus video don't. to the world. Oh my god, please. Hold it in. I have to. Video. I have to do it. I have to make a calculus video. Oh. All I see it when I. Close I can't help my it. All I so see when I close my eyes. Oh! 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 All right. I'm gonna start off by talking about what this video isn't. This video isn't for people who are cramming the night before their calculus final. I'm not going to teach you all of calculus in 30 seconds, and I'm not going to do any practice problems. But maybe. You're taking AP Calculus this year because you want to get into a good college. Or maybe you're already in college, majoring in something like computer science. You don't think calculus is like worth the hype and you don't understand why you're learning it. You're like a, you're like a math hipster. Well, in this video, I'm going to explain why calculus does live up to the hype and I'm going to do it without getting too technical. So let's dive in. And since this is a math video, why would I pass up the chance to break everything into a numbered list? Chapter one, change. Oh. It has been said before that the only constant in the world is change. And that's what calculus is about, change. All right, that's the video, you know everything about calculus. But seriously, a lot of really important things in this world are changing now more than ever. Economies are changing due to the prices of goods and services or the rate of employment. Spaceships and satellites are always in motion throughout the solar system. And my sleep schedule is seriously like all over the place. Calculus is the closest thing to a crystal ball that human beings have because it whittles down all of the change into something that's predictable. You might remember problems about rates of change. If Aaron talks at, say, 150 words per minute, he'll be editing this video essay all goddamn night. You could plot a graph of how many words Aaron has said so far and how long he's talked for and the points you would plot on that graph would trace a straight line. But the truth is that while it's nice to think that Aaron will talk at a totally constant rate, he won't. He's going to slow down when he tells a cringy joke that doesn't land, and he's going to speed up when he starts to explain something complicated so you won't understand. So this totally straight y equals mx plus b situation that you learned in middle school is not really applicable to the real world. Even the rate of change itself changes. Only constant in life is change. This is where we get into the concept of the derivative. When you're driving a car, for example, you can look at the speedometer to see how fast you're going at any given point in time. For example, if a car can do zero to 60 in three seconds, it's gonna travel really far during that time. But inside the driver's seat, looking at that speedometer, it's just going to travel from zero to 60 in that time. That little speedometer moving along is kind of like the derivative. And taking the derivative of a function is sort of like looking at the speedometer. But you, you probably shouldn't look at the speedometer. You should probably look at the road. This is why sometimes teachers will use the concept of a tangent line to illustrate a derivative. It's taking a little y mx plus b situation at a single point in time. Taking that tangent line on a function or an instantaneous rate of change has so many applications. It like, it, it just gets more relevant every year. It's like the top Forbes th three most relevant fields of mathematics. Three, the three under, three under three. Not every function has a derivative because not every function is differentiable. In fact, to be differentiable as a function is a special privilege, and there are a series of tests you actually have to run before you can determine that a function has a derivative. But once you know that it does, it's insanely useful. Chapter two, broken clocks are right twice a day. Have you heard of the watchmaker analogy? No one ever talks about the watchmaker analogy. Back in the late bumpteen hundreds, Isaac Newton discovered the famous laws of motion and was able to chart the motion of the planets. This was a really cute thing that humanity was super proud of itself for doing. And even to this day, a look around any kindergarten classroom shows that we cannot shut the f up about it. My very educated mother just seems 
unbelievably nerdy and pretentious. Among physicists, one of the most important laws is F equals MA, which means force equals mass times acceleration. What does that mean? Well, if you remember from the problem before that even the rate of change changes, the change, just one change, is the speed or velocity. The change in the change is actually known as the acceleration. So when you have some mass in space, like a person or a spaceship or Princess Leia, sorry, too soon. The change in the change is known as the acceleration. And what Newton's law says is that that's equal to the force enacted on the object. Crazy. Equations like F equals MA began to pop up all over the place. It was really weird that these mathematical equations could describe natural phenomena so perfectly. It led people to view the universe as this like perfect thing, like it was a watch with a bunch of cute little Rube Goldberg tracks and gears perfectly meshed together. And that's where we get the watchmaker analogy uh, with God as a watchmaker. Of course, now we know that the universe isn't a watch, it's a simulation. But there is something familiar about humans using the technology we created to create a theory of creation. That's how revolutionary calculus was. It was consciousness shifting. Chapter three, derivatives all the way down. Hey there. So, the derivative is the speed. The derivative of the derivative, or the change in the change, is acceleration. Can you go any deeper than that? Of course you can. Of course you can go deeper than that. You go as deep as you want. Like Mary Poppins' purse, or an all-you-can-eat buffet at your cousin's wedding. But yeah, the next derivative up is the derivative of the derivative of the derivative. So that's the change and the change and the change. The third derivative for anybody who's counting. So while the first derivative, or the change, is called the velocity or the speed. The second derivative is called acceleration. The third derivative is called jerk. It's when the acceleration changes, so when the amount of force changes. When you go from like having no force to force, there's like a jerk. So that's why it's called that. In 1972, Richard Nixon actually used the third derivative rhetorically. He argued that the rate of increase of inflation was decreasing. Inflation is already the change in the dollar. So the rate of increase on inflation is already, okay, so that's already the change in the change. So that's the change in the change. So the rate of change of inflation is decreasing. So that's inflation, rate of change, decreasing. So that's the change in, in the change in the change. Richard Nixon, everybody. First time, actually, a president ever invoked the third derivative on the campaign trail. So give Nixon some credit. You might have guessed that derivatives get a little bit more obscure. The fourth derivative is called snap. The fifth one is called crackle. And the sixth one is called pop. I'm not joking. Math Krispies. Rice Math Krispies. This is the end of the video. I didn't really write. I, didn't, I don't know. I don't know what happens beyond here. This actually doesn't cover all of calculus. There's more videos in the future that I will have to integrate into the series. So I'll see you. I'll see you soon.